Hi, today is the 13th of June. It's around, I guess around noon. And I'm Jack Byer, your American narrow boater. This morning, I am here on the uh, River Soar in Leicester, England. Uh, we're on our way around the Leicester Ring and this is where we've gotten to on Monday. Uh, this boat you see behind me is the Isabel and the Isabel is a story all of its own and perhaps we'll be able to see that in a future vlog. I met the owner of the Isabel today and what a privilege. He's an amazing man, lived a rich full life, has wonderful stories to tell about the cut. Uh, he was one of the original founders of the International Waterways. He's intimately uh, knowledgeable with Aiken and Roth and all the other founders of the International Waterways. He proudly wears it on this hat. And I'm gonna, just gonna cut to the chase. With his permission, I'm gonna bring you Tony. Hi, this My is- My name's G Tony Rival, by the way. Go for it, just keep on going, Hi. Tony. <clears throat> so in 1957, I moved on to this, my uncle's boat. And uh, I was happy living on the boat on the Grand Union Canal, and I lived at Rigmansworth, which is in north of London. And there were just three boats there then. And every morning I was woken up by the barge going by taking coal to the John Dickinson mill. My job at the time <coughs> was to convert their heating system to gas. Wow. And uh, I didn't wake up one morning because the <laughs> boat didn't go past because we were no longer taking coal. And anyhow, this made me realize that we were losing our canal network because people like me were stopping the companies from using coal. And what was the year? 1957. Okay. And uh, <coughs> Anyhow, I lived on the boat and every Friday night we would take the boat down to the block where the pub was, fill up with water and other essentials. What was the pub? <laughs> it was called the Railway Tavern actually because the, the railway which had been there as well had been closed by then. Um, we always knew it as Percy's because he was the landlord. <laughs> and about six weeks later, because the canal wasn't being used commercially, the lock get the steps was starting to crumble away. So I decided to go out and didn't know who owned it, didn't know who owned the canal. So I decided yeah. I would mend it. So I went and bought a few bricks and replaced the steps. Then I thought, gosh, they look terrible because they're standing out bright red against the dirty color it was before. So I bought some whitewash and was painting them. And a little bespectacled gentleman came along and said, what, young, what are you doing, young man? And I nothing, sir, I'm just <laughs> painting it. <'cause> it <laughs> And he said to me, well, if you're so interested in this, you should join us. <laughs> and that was Robert Aitman, who was one of the founders of the Inland Waterways. Really? Who just happened to be going by and stored them. Okay. And he took ten and sixpence off me, which was the annual membership for a young person <laughs> at, the, gotcha. at the time. And I've been a member ever since. Wow. Which you can see on my cap badge. It says Inland wow. Waterways Association. <laughs> And, uh, well, back then the British Waterways owned the canals, right? They had nationalized no, the British them? British Waterways didn't have been owned, and it was the British Transport Commission. Gotcha. Closed uh, brackets, Waterways Division closed brackets, which was really running the railways because of course, the railways had bought out most of the canals right. to take the trade away right. from them. And there were just as few of us who realized that they were lovely, they were essential. They did a lot of things other than just God carry bless coal. you. God bless you guys, because without and that, well. Wow. That's when I started getting involved. Robert Aikman said, right then. So the very first thing I got involved in was the uh, River Avon in Worcestershire, um, which we... From Stratford-upon-Avon to Tewkesbury? Yeah. Okay. And um, again, one of those strange things, it was privately owned, the navigation rights. And this fella bought the navigation rights for £5,000, but the river wasn't navigable because it was all derelict. Wow. So volunteers restored it over the years. And this is in the 60s this or 70s? In the, in, in the early 60s. Okay. And that was the very first real restoration that took place. Uh, <coughs> it's still going on, still <laughs> being maintained in the same way. But it's a lovely canal. Yeah, and uh, then we sort of grew and grew. And the very first thing I was sort of told to get on with was because I came from the West Country, 
Yes. Um, it was the, the Kennet Avon Canal, which was abandoned, mm -hmm. and British railway, the British waterways, as it was by then, wanted to officially abandon it. Excuse me, just for context, the, the KNA is a canal that runs on the southern side of England from the River Thames over to Bristol? To Bristol on the river. So it's a major east-west artery on the southern side of England. Go ahead. That's right. And um, it was a long canal. It's 99 miles long, which by British standards is a long way. Mm -hmm. and, and it had over 99 locks every one of which was derelict. Wow. And, but it has a river at both ends, so little bits of it were easy, shall we say, because uh -huh. it was just a matter of being, you could, we'd got water in a river. And it took us 30 years, but we kept at it. And in 1990, Her Majesty the Queen came and opened the Kenneth Avon Canal for the first time. Wow, so how did you guys raise money for all that? With great difficulty, is <laughs> <laughs> the answer. Um, <clears throat> this is where the skill came in. Really, it was a first of all getting other people to see it as an asset. Uh -huh. Then it was persuading them to lobby yep. people, government. Then to say, what happens if we lose it? That was the next thing. And eventually, you had to break through to someone in local government who said, "This is important to our town, or our community, whatever it might be." That's when you make the breakthrough, and you could perhaps persuade them that uh, their local local government would pay to restore the towpath to gotcha. a pleasant walk. And, and that's you, a start, uh, right? Yeah. And then you get people walking past and yeah. they say, it's a pity there isn't more than just a bit of mud in there, yep. isn't there? And so it grows on. <laughs> and eventually, you might get money from yeah. a higher source. It took a long time. Gotcha. But, God, it was worth it. I hear you. So tell me about the, the falling out between Aiken... <laughs> well... It was, why we, do we want to restore them, was the question that came up at several meetings. Is it just for the heritage? And <clears throat> Robert Aikman wanted them to bring back all the trade. And <clears throat> Tom Rolfe said, There's a, that's, that's, that's not the market anymore. That won't work. We've got to find something else, some other reason for wanting them. And he said, there's a whole leisure market going to develop. We've just had a war. This country is in absolute abject poverty, but people are going to want to go on holiday. What forethought? And he said, you can't afford to go anywhere else. I mean, you, you wouldn't know this, you American people, but we were only allowed 25 pounds per year in foreign currency for years and years and years. Well, I remember the, the diets you guys had yeah. to go through yeah, during two, World War II. Two ounces of meat a week <laughs> in this one. Anyhow, uh, um, Aikman saw nothing but commercial carrying, which Walt couldn't see. All he could see was recreational mm -hmm. use and the heritage. Let's market. If we, we can sell people coming and look at our cathedrals. Yep. So why can't they come and look at our engineering? Gotcha. That's just his attitude. Aikman was a, a writer. Walt was an engineer. That's the different mindsets, isn't it? Gotcha. And uh, um, that's what they fell out of <laughs> so you knew them both personally? I knew them both. I knew Aikman initially better than I knew Tom Rolt, but I got to know um, Rolt's wife very well uh -huh. after he died. Uh -huh. um, he died comparatively young, and uh, um, she lived in the southwest, so did I. And uh, I went to meetings, and she often was there. So th this, this story that we've heard about, the meeting at the top of the Tartabiggy flight. That was what... I mean, Rolf wrote his book, Narrow Boat, um, <clears throat> and there was no, nobody else seemed to be interested. Excuse me, for context, we're here in Leicester. It's the uh, 13th of, of June in 2022, and this Canadian goose wants to add his sixpence. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, cold. go ahead. <laughs> um, so he wrote to Rolf um, and said, Look, I've read your book. And uh, I think there's something in canals that we've, everybody's overlooking. So Rolt invited him to come up and visit him. He was living on Cressy at Tartabig, at the top lock, which he had been for most of the war. And um, they met up and they said, agreed that a, a, a group needed to be formed to campaign for it. And they 
decided to call a meeting in uh, Aikman's flat in London. And one of the people who came to it was a man called Charles Hatfield. And many of you may have read some of his history books. Uh -huh. And Hatfield turned up and he said, excuse me, is this where the Inland Waterways Association is meeting? And he was the one who decided <laughs> on the name. <laughs> Sorry, I history, I and I tell you, it's... And Charles Hatfield was a civil servant. He became a London County Council councillor. During the war, uh, which is so significant in what people did at the time, he um, was an academic, but during the war, he became a firefighter. And he was on the boats on the Thames, the, the river firefighting people. And he then... Sort of, Everything is not very well organised, so he wrote the sort of manual for how to run a fire brigade, which is still to this day the, the background for all, certainly water-based fire brigades, anyhow. Oh, wow! Um, but he uh, carried on and was an, an historian, and he came from the Midlands, but he went transferred to the southwest, and he started to... Um, do a bit of research into bits and pieces and he nothing else to do I suppose decided that he would he was told by his uh, mother here's a, a, a box of documents look at these and see what it is and he found the archive of the building at the Grand Western Canal wow which fired his enthusiasm as a history what's that I've not heard the Grand Western I've heard of the Grand Union yeah, well, the Grand Western is the big failure, if you like. <laughs> the Grand Western is 11 miles long. It was meant to join the Bristol Channel to the English Channel. Oh my goodness. Um, just got I know little, I know just where it is now. They got the little mind. bit in the middle now. Yeah, there's another friend of mine, uh, Paul and Rebecca Whitchurch, did a video on that, yeah. a vlog on that. Go ahead. Uh, anyhow, um, it got him fired up with these great engineers. So he started being an a, a academic and an administrator, he wrote it all down very meticulously. And he's now got this whole series of books, uh, The Canals of the, of the British Isles. Um, wow. I've got a copy of every one of them. And uh, You're lucky because you can't buy those anymore. Not very easily. They're out of print. Yeah, I know. And uh, um, I want to borrow one. I've got the canals of the, <laughs> the, the South West. It's alone. too precious a yeah. treasure to borrow. Especially I'm sorry. Mine are all autographed as well. Uh, but oh, wow. that set him off as a, to be interested in it. Got him involved in the Inner Waterways Association. But when he became a councillor in London before he moved back to the South West again, he had to resign because you can't have any vested interests. Do you want to sit down? I mean, I hate to keep you yeah. on your feet. Uh, you know, you can't have a... If you're a councillor, you've got to be neutral in your, with any of the bodies that you might be uh -huh. to campaign against or for. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, um, but he kept the interest. And he and his wife... Well, again, they, they were the first people who introduced me to America having waterways, having written a book oh. called The Float in America. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, um, they, he travelled everywhere, uh -huh. and he documented it so thoroughly. Now, was he the one that did the first big research into all of the existing canals and their condition here in England? Pretty well, yeah. And he's um, other people helped him as well, obviously, over the years. But uh, it was Charles Hatfield who inspired other historians uh -huh. to say, oh, we can research into this. Um, most people ignored canals. Yeah, until they started using them. Yeah, I mean, canals are places where you threw your rubbish. I hear you. There's still people that throw that. rubbish. That's Hence, a, mag, what they call it, magnet fishing? Yeah, that's right. Saw a fellow doing it yesterday. Oh, wow. Would you find anything? I don't I know yeah. really did or not. So getting back to this meeting that mm -hmm. happened in the London flat. Where, um, ha, where, yeah, they getting... where they decided that they would form an association, uh, a body. They, they wrote the very first... Um, aspirational uh, charter. charter, if you like. It's been modified a few times since then. Um, and said, right, what are we going to do? And the first, they agreed that the first thing... And you were they, there at that meeting? I wasn't at the meeting. No, I was, hadn't yet joined. Uh -huh. I was still only 10 then, 11. 10? <laughs> uh, so, but it was 10 years later that I joined. Uh -huh. and, I, and I heard it all, but I heard it all firsthand. Uh -huh. That's the difference, I suppose. Gotcha. And um, How many were at the meeting? Six. Six, six. people. Okay. And uh, 
that they decided that there would be a very modest membership fee and that everybody would set about trying to do something and that one person would have a project and they would see what they could do. They didn't quite know how they would go about it for, initially. Mm -hmm. Where do you start? Campaigning bodies were very rare just mm -hmm. after the war and this is 1947. It's so what was the first project they took on? What was the first canal? The Tardy Biggie flight then was still in operation. That was still operating, just, yes. I mean, there was still commercial traffic. Yeah. Um, um, Rolt was probably one of the very first leisure users. Uh -huh. um, he wasn't quite the very first one. I got a book written by somebody in 1860 something or other when they did a tour of Britain by canal boat, but they, they, they stayed in hotels at night and <laughs> this sort of thing. It wasn't quite the same. And they didn't do most of it, but they did do the uh, Thames and Severn Canal, gotcha. um, which is course still not yet restored. Well, it will be. It will be. Uh, I've been working on that for years now. Oh, that's your favourite pet project now? It's one of my favourite. I think the one I work on hardest is the Way and Aaron Canal uh, down in Sussex because I live in that part of the world. Uh -huh. And uh, that one has been abandoned for over 150 years now. But we've got things back and we're slowly buying the land through the line we need it. But it's in the most expensive part of the country. So you want to buy a strip <laughs> of land and it costs you what you could, you could buy a state for. <laughs> well, We've managed to convince a developer on the way in Aaron, on the summit level, where we needed to have the re the reservoir reinstalled. Right. That's been taken away, and oh, we, it's not even there. No, huh? oh, uh, wow. they built an airfield on it during the war, which is where they film um, a well-known television program in this country called Top Gear. No fault. And uh, but that site is coming up for development, and they want to build a thousand houses there. And we have persuaded the developer that the ideal development is a network of, of canals around it so all the properties have a water backing frontage or a backage. Sure. <laughs> and then, but it's at the summit level. And then we can then take the waters, feed the canal. How so, would you fill the summit though? Well, as they, are, as they used to, of course, it's, are they it's not the, the highest water? point, but there's a, a water supply could be fed into there. Gotcha. Um, but at the moment it's all been diverted elsewhere and it's gone, you know, that's the plan, anyhow. It may be 30 years away. It's, uh, well, let's hope. Let's hope um, it happens. But so, anyhow, that's the way that we had to work. In the early days, you had to look a long way ahead. Yeah. I mean, there's good examples of that. We've been working on the restoration of the Montgomery Canal. Oh, the, you know, when I did my first canal, 1976, Montgomery Canal wasn't there. No, but it, it went, was. But it was it all blocked off. It wasn't connected. It was just that we restored the Franklin um, three locks, top locks there, uh -huh. at, uh, with volunteers, and they managed to persuade uh, the town council on one section of it to restore the bit through uh, the town. At, uh, God, I'm getting old, I can't remember the name of the town now. That's uh, all right. And uh, there's now just two little bits left in between. Unfortunately, they built a motorway across there. <laughs> no, so, but building a motorway bridge over your canal is expensive, <laughs> but the aspirations it will happen yes and there's an, a bridge the last other bridge will be actually completed this year we won't be able to get water under it yet but they've got a bridge there so i hope i might live long enough to actually to run that one eh go and part of it anyhow there you go and and i still enjoy watching this again what a delightful man and what a wonderful conversation i do have more video of it uh, he, we have a piece about his boat, the Isabella, which is gorgeous, and other other issues that he talked about about the canals. This is a guy that, you know, you've got to hear the story now because these people aren't staying around forever to tell you. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed this vlog. If you did, please hit the like button down below. Feel free to subscribe. I love subscribers. <laughs> and if you want to know when the next issue is, and it'll probably be the final Tony issue, click the notification button. Thanks again. This is Jack Byer, your American narrowboater, saying thank you for watching. Have a nice day.